Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. Jim Morrison's most impactful and important relationship, of course, was his relationship with longtime on-again, off-again girlfriend Pamela Corson. But of course, that was far from his only relationship. Jim Morrison dated many women over the years, including Krista Fagan, better known as Nico from the Velvet Underground. They had a very passionate relationship, to which at one point she even asked Jim to ask her to get married. Jim Morrison, being Jim Morrison, apparently fell off his chair laughing when she said that to him, even though he was really into her. They had a very interesting relationship. As a matter of fact, Jim Morrison wasn't the only rock star Nico had been with. Nico had also dated Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones, which Jim Morrison was acutely aware of and asked her questions about. So in other words, Nico had dated two of the prominent future members of the 27 Club. In any case, in this video, I'm going to read to you a segment from Jim Morrison Life Death Legend by Stephen Davis, where he discusses the relationship Jim Morrison had with Nico. I have a lot of Jim Morrison and Doors related material on this channel. If you like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is to subscribe, like, and share. Quote, In August 1967, between Doors gigs on both coasts, Jim Morrison left Pamela Corson and plunged into a passionate resumption of his affair with musician and actress Nico. The bombshell German avant-garde sultana was staying at John Philip Law's Concrete Castle in Los Feliz while trying to write songs for her first solo album on Elektra Records. She was also one of the stars of Warhol's film Chelsea Girls, about to make its Los Angeles debut. Jim loved Nico's sultry Berlin accent and cold rock operatic Wagnerian aura, and he deeply respected her connection to Federico Fellini. She also let Jim do what he wanted to her. She was two inches taller than Jim, even broader in the shoulders. Nico was physically strong, was a little older than Jim, and was probably even crazier. She was also extremely intelligent and still bore a slight black eye that Brian Jones had given her when he'd smacked her at Monterey. Jim insisted that Nico tell him everything that Brian had ever said to her. Nico insisted that Jim teach her how to write a song. Nico's friend said later that she really gave her heart to Jim. She loved him with a lioness-like intensity that frightened even her. He drove her, with the car radio blaring Light My Fire and Aretha Franklin's respect, out to some of his desert haunts. The Indian Canyon around Palm Springs, Joshua Tree National Monument, Death Valley, where they took acid trips together a couple of times. When he told her about the girls he'd loved in the past, Nico dyed her trademark straight blonde hair a lustrous pale red. He had this thing for shanties with red hair, Nico remembered. You know, Irish shanties. Nico had an endearing way with English slang. Shanty was her word for chick. He was the first man I was in love with. I was so in love with Jim that I made my own hair red after a while. I wanted to please his taste. It was silly, no? Like a teenager or something. When Jim saw this, Nico later said it made him cry. She asked him to propose marriage to her. He laughed so hard he fell off his chair. So she hit him. We hit each other because we were drunk and we enjoyed the sensation, she said. The lyrics the two of them worked on became part of Nico's superb 1968 album, The Marble Index, whose song titles have an undeniable echo of her collaboration with Jim Morrison. Lawn of Dawns, Frozen Warnings, Evening of Light. Nico was unsure of herself, as she'd always sung the songs of others and was writing in English, a foreign language to her. Jim gave me permission to become a writer, she said later. He said to me, I give you permission to write your poems and compose your songs. Jim, my soul brother, believed I could do it. I had his authority. His song, Light My Fire, was the most popular song in America. Jim never mentioned Nico in his extant notebooks, but late that month, he was often seen with her at the castle, sometimes balancing on the parapet above the pool during the hot summer nights. Downstairs, other castle residents, Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, screenwriter Terry Southern, were writing the early drafts of the screenplay that would become Easy Rider. The ultra-hip, post-beat clique regarded Jim Morrison as a parvenu punk because of his notoriety and his narcissism, his out leather trousers that put on shyness. They were also annoyed that he was with Nico. But at least one of the hipster adepts hanging around the castle, poet and playwright Michael McClure, who was also working on a novel about a cocaine dealer, took the trouble to talk to Jim. This meant a lot to Morrison, who invited McClure to visit the studio when the door started recording again. Meanwhile, Pamela Corson didn't see Jim for a month, but she knew where he was and who he was with, and she didn't take the public payback and humiliation lying down. Actually, she did take it lying down. She had a fling with a friend of Jim's. Pamela also let it slip to local gossips, but not to breathe one word, but she was having an affair with John Philip Law. 
This was a huge deal since Law, Jane Fonda's co-star in Roger Vadim's 1967 comic sci-fi movie, Barbarella, was considered an A-list sexual conquest. Law later vehemently denied any sexual liaison with Pamela Corson, describing his relationship with her as only a few dinner dates. He knew Pam through her sister, Judy, and as a ploy to get Jim Morrison's attention. Jim Morrison's torrid affair with Nico lasted a few weeks longer, and then he petered out in exhaustion. Jim went back to Pamela, as he always did. Nico dyed her hair an even darker shade of red.